Understanding how something works is not always necessary to completely appreciate the benefit that we can receive from it. But it does help us to be reassured that whatever it is that we're considering is trustworthy, reliable, legitimate. You see, I don't need to understand how a plane leaves the runway to know that it can take me to the Caribbean. But a few very sort of basic GCSE um, facts about aerodynamics will help me to appreciate that when I get onto a plane, I'm not trusting my life to a magic flying carpet. I have every reason to believe that the 450 ton 747, for example, can take me safely to St. Lucia. Uh, take this debit card as another example. It has what we call contactless technology. I mean, we just take it for granted these days, don't we? We've all got contactless cards in our pockets and we hope that people don't take advantage of that as we walk around in, in busy, crowded places. Take this contactless card. So I walk into Sainsbury's and I choose some lunch. I don't know, six Melton Mowbray pork pies, some grapes and some crisps, let's say. The transaction, £3.57. I go up to the terminal. I present my contactless card and, well, it could appear like magic, couldn't it? Until I do a little bit of sort of Googling, 30 seconds, no more, and I find out that actually it's not magic. Um, there happens to be inside this card a chip that emits radio waves, apparently. I didn't think radio waves really existed anymore. I thought we were beyond that. But radio waves are emitted and a contactless reader picks up the signal and Sainsbury's will then send a message to my bank with the authority that I've given it by presenting this card and a transaction takes place. My debt is settled. Well, how much more with the cross? As a Christian, we talk about the cross saving us. That's true. But how does the cross on which Jesus died actually save me? Is it magic? Or is there logic in what happens? That's the question that we're considering today as we dive into the next part of John's Gospel. Well, my name is Chris Fishlock. I'm part of the leadership team across different lunchtime talks. A very warm welcome to our lunchtime talk today. The story so far in John's Gospel. John has been telling us lots up until this point about Jesus. He's also been telling us quite a lot about us, humanity. Jesus, God's Son, came to show us what God is like in a way that makes sense to us. We know how to relate to a person and Jesus shows us how we can relate to God. Jesus also shows us, though, as we read through John's Gospel, what we are like. Humanity shares a common trait, sin. And that just means we ignore God, we push him to the outside of our life. Like when we go to a hotel room and hang that do not disturb sign on the door. It's like we all, in our natural state, have told God to shove off. Well, when it comes to God, this means that we have a serious problem as human beings. We all have a crime that stands against us. The Bible's word for this is sin. And that means we have a problem. God sees us naturally with a problem because of our sin. So that's the story so far. Obviously, there's still a little bit more that needs to be said, and that's Brings, in, brings us today to John 18. The first point, Jesus gives himself into the hands of the authorities. Verse 1, chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met them there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him,
came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Now did you notice as I was reading that just now, Jesus is not surprised with what happens, verse 4, knowing all that would happen. There is no doubt he is acting deliberately in every part of what follows. I mean, here is Jesus giving himself into the hands of the authorities. But there is a sinister backdrop. I wonder if you notice that as well. A repeated refrain comes up twice in verse 2, verse 5 as well. Judas, who betrayed him. You see, the betrayer is there, and he has soldiers and officers. Now, when I first heard this story, I remember thinking, uh, maybe there's a group of, you know, four or five, or, or maybe at the most 12 soldiers and officers standing nearby. But actually, as I delved into the language in a little bit more depth, there's a word that's used in the original text a band of soldiers, a cohort. It's a technical term used in the Roman legions. It could actually mean a few hundred men and cavalry. You see, Roman soldiers took their business very seriously indeed. It's designed to show us that when Roman soldiers turn up to take part in some sort of soldiering business, well, they take their work very seriously indeed. This was undoubtedly a show of force, and they came prepared. Verse three, lanterns, torches, weapons. I mean, it would be enough to make the most hardened criminal shake. And that's what makes it all the more amazing when Jesus speaks first. Jesus takes the initiative, verse four, whom do you seek? He takes control in the conversation. You see, he's not sort of caught off guard. He's acting deliberately and gives himself into the hands of the authorities. I don't know what image you have of Jesus in your minds, but just appreciate here how brave, how noble a thing to do, to, to, to sort of step forward in his words and give himself into the hands of the Roman authorities. That brings us to the second point. Jesus, God's son, gives himself for the sake of his people. Let me read from verse six. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so, if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. John is such a great storyteller, isn't he? I mean, this is really exciting stuff. Did you notice what happens when Jesus utters those words, I am he? I mean, the Roman soldiers actually fall down. It's quite amazing. I mean, imagine the imperial Roman army especially if there were hundreds of them, which there quite probably were. Imagine them hearing some words from this man and then stepping back and falling like dominoes. I mean, I would have loved to have been there to see that happen. It would have been incredible. A reminder, of course, of Jesus' true identity. This is no mere man. This is God's son giving himself up those words that he utters, I am he, undoubtedly reminding us of Old Testament images of, of God's own voice, God's own name, I am he. The words have a ripple effect and they fall down like toy soldiers. I think though the point really comes in verse nine, you see, John the narrator tells us that this act of self-sacrifice is also fulfilling something that Jesus had said. This act of giving himself into their hands secures the release of his people, just as was promised. 
We're familiar, of course, aren't we, with the idea of one man standing in for another. Uh, that's not a, a particularly sort of revolutionary idea. But the point here is more substantial. Jesus doesn't say this to save a friend or even two. He deliberately gives himself into the hands of the authorities so that all the people that God, his Father, has given him are saved. Not every single person in this world, but every person, past, present, and future, who has or who would one day put their trust in him. So I think that sort of raises a, a question, doesn't it, at, at this stage in the narrative. What is it about giving himself up that can possibly trigger the release of all of these people? And that brings us thirdly and finally. Jesus gives himself to drink the cup of God's wrath. Verse 10. The pace quickens at this point. I think it's there to sort of make our hearts race a little bit. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Well, the flurry of adrenaline is quickly dampened. For a split second, it did look like a fight, but Jesus remains the one in control, and he tells Peter to put away his sword. And then there's this curious phrase at the end of verse 11. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? Now, this is the only time that the cup is mentioned in John's Gospel. You won't be surprised to hear that the cup is an Old Testament idea. And it's used in a number of ways in the Old Testament, but a clear reference here is to a cup of judgment, a cup of God's wrath. Let me just quote from one place. Uh, if you want to sort of cross-check it another time, I, I think the words will come up now on the screen. This is Psalm 75. It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. The cup of foaming wine, it is a vivid image. It's, it's easy to imagine, isn't it? I think it helps us to picture God's punishment. God's punishment, which is, of course, deserved by the wicked, those who have sinned against God. Any of us who have pushed God out of our lives. Remember, as we began, I reminded us that that image, the idea of, of hanging a do not disturb sign on our hotel bedroom, well, in the same way, every single one of us that has pushed God out of our lives, do not disturb me, we're sinners. We are wicked in God's sight in our natural state. And of course, from God's perspective, this doesn't go unnoticed. There is a punishment that must be paid. But here's the wonderful technical bit. I deserve the punishment that's in that cup. I mean, it's, it's undeniably true. Before I was a Christian, all of my life lived without reference to God, with reference to myself, my agenda, living my way. And even as a Christian, although forgiven, my life continues to fall short of God's standards. You see, being a Christian doesn't immediately mean that I'm good every day, I make mistakes. But being a Christian means that I'm sorry. Sorry for my independence and so thankful for what Jesus has done. Because you see, on the cross, Jesus drank that cup to the dregs. The measure of the punishment that I deserved included in that cup, Jesus drank and I get the benefits. Isn't that amazing? Jesus gives himself to drink the cup 
of God's wrath. That's what John's gospel says, end of verse 11. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? This is how Jesus saves. He drinks the cup for me. He takes the full wrath, the punishment that God must give because he is a good and just God. He must not ignore crimes that take place in this world. And Jesus takes them for me. When Jesus cries out in agony on the cross, it wasn't primarily the torture, the nails, or the physical pain. It was the horror of that cup, the horror of experiencing God's wrath, the punishment that I deserved, the punishment that all God's people deserved. Jesus drank it to the dregs. Now, there's a technical word. It's, it's not used in our passage, but it is used in a number of places in the Bible. Propitiation. And that means to take away God's wrath. That's what happens when a, a cup is, is drunk. When something is drunk to the dregs, the contents are gone. They're taken away. Jesus takes the full and just punishment all of God's anger that I deserve, that all his people deserve, Jesus' death bears that punishment for me. You see, there's no magic in the cross. There is a just punishment given to someone who doesn't deserve it. A punishment given for his people, for me, amazingly. And do you know what? For you too, if you will trust and believe this man and his death was necessary for you. Look at Peter. When we first read this, I mean, didn't you just think Peter was a, a wonderful hero, grabbing a sword and sort of charging into these Roman soldiers, especially if there's a few hundreds, I keep saying, it would have been a scary sight. What a brave thing to do. That was the first sort of reading. But actually, Peter is a picture here of somebody trying to do it their own way. Peter is a picture of somebody who would actually try and have Jesus avoid the cross. But you see, there's no other way to deal with God's wrath. Either Jesus takes it by drinking the cup, or Peter, and we will have to take it instead. And so Peter here stands for all those who don't like the idea of, of Jesus having to actually die. Our sin, our undeniable rejection of God, our natural desire to go it alone. God just can't pretend I'm a good bloke. God, in fact, made me a perfect bloke by giving the punishment that I deserve to his son. That's an amazing thing. This is how Jesus saves me and all his people. And so as we close, I'd like to suggest that all of life comes down to a decision around the events that we're talking about. Will we recognize Jesus, God's son who gave himself up to drink the cup for his people? Ultimately, Either we drink that cup and carry on living that life without reference to God, or we let Jesus drink that cup and live our lives thankful for what he has done. That's what it means to, to put your faith in Jesus. Believe that he drank the cup to the dregs for you. Well, perhaps I can lead us in a very short prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus, so brave, so noble, would give himself up deliberately and take the punishment that I deserve. I pray, Heavenly Father, that all of us listening today will think really carefully about the personal implication. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for joining us today at our lunchtime talk.